I'm afraid they do. This is a story, I wouldn't say close to my heart, but with which I have some familiarity. I used to work at the IMF yeah. in Washington, D.C. as an economist. And it seems in recent years they've had a real downer on the UK. I did a calculation six months ago that 27 of the IMF's last 30 forecasts on the UK economy have been too pessimistic, have particularly they really? since 2016. The US doesn't like the fact that we left the European Brexit. Union. And now the IMF has forecast that this year we're going to grow by 0.4%, which keeps us ahead of Germany because Germany are in recession, their yeah. economy is contracting. But next year, we're going to grow by 0.6%, by which time the other G7 advanced industrial economies will have caught up and overtaken us, leaving us last at the bottom of the league table of growth, economic expansion among advanced industrialized societies. I don't think that's true. And why, what, on what basis are they making, have they revised us backwards? Well, they're saying that the UK is particularly prone to inflation. They're also saying that UK interest rates are going to go up a lot further than they already are. Really? The Bank of England's increased interest rates to 5.25%. The IMF is saying that interest rates in this country will peak at 6%, which is, if that's true, that's terrible news for lots of mortgage holders, people with personal loans, businesses who are indebted. It's also worth saying, Andrew, do you remember over the summer... The, the, the Office of National Statistics announced it had miscalculated growth over recent I do. years. I do. And far from the UK having the slowest recovery from recession uh, after the global pandemic, actually we had one of the fastest. So now our growth, our recovery since the pandemic is again in the middle of the pack of the G7 right, yeah. advanced industrialized countries. Guess what? That was months ago. The IMF have not included those revisions in their current estimate. Why? It strikes me as... Remiss, remiss at best or deliberate well a bad judgment let's say because they would have had time to include them if they wanted to look for many many years now the imf has got i forecasts about the uk economy wrong if the imf were correct andrew this country would currently be in recession the economy would currently be contracting but it isn't contracting it grew by about 0.3 percent over the last quarter which given that interest rates have been going up around the world wasn't bad so i do think this is over gloomy objectively i think any economist who looks back over recent imf forecasts would agree there seems to be a systemic gloominess towards the UK. But that doesn't matter because this will be reported across mainstream broadcast outlets in many of the newspapers that yet again the UK is at the bottom of the growth league within the G7. Labour will make hay with that. I tell you what, the IMF didn't include recent uh, revisions in its estimate of British growth, as I just said, but I bet like Keir Starmer's revising his speech now yeah. to include a paragraph which says, yet again, we're at the bottom of the UK growth, of the Worldwide Growth League among advanced industrialised countries, according to the International Monetary Fund. And it's interesting because Pat McFadden, who's Labour's campaign director, was on uh, GB News Breakfast this morning with Eamon and Isabel, and he was talking about the impact on the, inter the economy of, of COVID and of um, uh, the Ukraine war. But when it suits them, they completely exclude that from when they want to criticise the British government's economic record. I think they look, want it both ways. The whole economy, the whole global economy, has is down in the doldrums to some, some extent. Sure. We've had you know, a once in a century pandemic, yeah. which led to the biggest economic contraction in recorded history. Then we had the war in Ukraine, which has hit Western Europe particularly hard, unlike the States, because the States has got much cheaper energy because yeah. it fracks, it produces a lot of its own oil and gas. Europe, the UK, we've suffered because our energy prices have been particularly high. And the UK does have the highest electricity prices in Europe now for various reasons, and that is slowing growth. But we also, Andrew, have a really good track record on inward business investment. We have a good track record of business creation. We have a good track record of entrepreneurialism. And our exports, to the, not only to the EU, but to the rest of the world, have never been higher. So the UK economy has shown a lot of resilience as the ONS, our own statistical service, had to acknowledge over the summer when it upgraded not just future growth forecasts for the UK, but our track record on past growth. The IMF has completely ignored what the ONS, which is one of the most yeah. respected statistical bodies in the world, it's completely ignored what the ONS has said over the summer. And that strikes me at the very best as a lack of judgment. Let's talk as well what's happening now, Liam, in the Middle East. Um, the impact on oil prices. If you go back to the 
the 50th anniversary of the war in 1973. There's a huge hike in oil prices. Britain ended up with a three-day week. The lights went out. Uh, there was a change of government the following year. Um, how much of an impact potentially does what's happening in the Middle East, and there seems to be no quick solution, what impact is that going to have on oil prices and the international economy and on Britain? Well, this is my worst case scenario, and I've written about it. I wrote about it on the GB News website yesterday. I've written about it in Telegraph columns I've, over very recent weeks. There is a concern, uh, and under these circumstances, the IMS forecast may be more credible that oil prices are rising, not just because the OPEC exporters cartel, led by the Saudis, yeah. are deliberately pumping less oil onto global markets to keep prices higher, artificially high. We have seen oil prices go up, Andrew, yeah. from around $70 a barrel in June to 90, even $95 a barrel this month. You know, ask any van driver, the price of filling up the van with diesel, so the family saloon with petrol has rocketed, particularly in August, but also in September as well. And now you have these tremendous, these awful events in Israel, this escalation of violence, which could spread across the Middle East. Fingers and toes crossed it doesn't, but that's the danger. And global oil markets, once again, are bidding up the price of oil. And OPEC, again, is restricting prices to push up that price of oil. It's not only so the OPEC members make more money. We're talking Iran, Iraq, Saudi, Venezuela, Nigeria. It's not only so they make more money. Some of the OPEC members actually want to put ideological pressure on the West, partly linked to the war in Ukraine and perhaps now linked to conflict open conflict between Israel and Hamas. That's geopolitics. That's, I'm afraid, how it works.